I turned over a bright metal shell that rippled when she I... She says human longing for mystery leads to a commonality of belief in immortality. Dad's late or I'm early. Either way, I have time to scout the pens. Can't Redemption and claustrophobia, what artists understand. Not valuing... Can everyone hear this? How's the audio in the back? Is it okay? Okay, great. Good evening. Welcome tonight. Thank you for coming out tonight. Even with our very changing weather, it is sunny right now, so I'm glad you all came. My name is Vicki Clark, and I am the curator of the Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors, and we are located one floor below us on the third floor. And for those of you who have not been there before, I really would encourage you to come and visit our room. We are a wonderful collection of works by and about Nebraska authors. And currently, we have over 10,000 volumes, which represents over 3,000 published authors from our state. That's just an incredible, wonderful wealth of literature and writing that we have here from our state. And tonight, I would like to welcome you to the 114th John H. Ames Reading Series program. Another wonderful thing. That means there's been 114 programs of Nebraska authors reading their work, and they're all on videotape. If you'd ever like to see them, just come to the library and check them out, too. Also, these programs are shown on Lincoln's Cable Channel 5, so just tune it in, and you can see those there, too. I'd also like to thank tonight the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association because it's through their volunteer support that we're able to bring you programs like these, so we are very, very grateful to them. But tonight, um, for our program, we have four wonderful readers. All of them tonight have a common bond. They have a passion for the written word and for the feel of language and the movement of words and phrases and sentences into thoughts and feelings and emotions. All of our readers are award-winning poets, and they all happen to live in or close to Lincoln, and they all have works collected in one particular book called The Plain Sense of Things Two: Eight Poets from Lincoln, Nebraska, which was edited by Mark Sanders. We're fortunate to have four of these, of the eight contributors to this work with us tonight. And I think it's particularly fitting to have this reading now since April is National Poetry Month. Roy Shields said once in an interview that he gave that Dana Joya who is a critic and poet from the East Coast said, and this was in 1988, that Nebraska undoubtedly has more good poets per capita than any other state in the country. Is that amazing? That's great, and we have a lot of them here tonight. What a wonderful treat. I believe this is very, very true, and it's a, a, another testament to the wellspring of talent that we have right here in our state. So I would like to briefly introduce now all of the poets who are going to be here, and I would encourage you, if you'd like to learn more about them and their works or all of the other Nebraska authors, to visit the Heritage Room when you can. There's um, some brochures back there that give you our hours and our times and, and other of our services. And you can review their books and read their works and also learn more about them with the literature and the files that we have collected there. And I should also mention that you probably saw on the table, we have a lot of books for sale. We have The Plain Sense of Things 2, the one we'll be reading from tonight. Also, Plain Sense of Things 1, which is outstate Nebraska poets. And there are also note cards representing the um, authors here tonight, as well as some of their other um, books that they've got collected. So please take a look back there. There's also um, all the proceeds, too. Um, there are proceeds that benefit the Heritage Room. And in particular, there's one book there, um, one of Roy Shields' books, that $7 of that book um, goes to the Heritage Room. That's the Keeping of the Horses book, too. So please take a look. I would also like to mention that we have coffee compliments of the mill, so you can smell that wonderful aroma as we're hearing our great works. But tonight, the first reader is Twyla Hansen, and she was raised on a farm in northeast Nebraska. And since 1982, she has been employed as a horticulturalist and arboretum curator at the Nebraska Wesleyan University. She lives in Lincoln and maintains her yard as an urban wildlife habitat. She has two collections of her own poetry, including How to Live in the Heartland and In Our Very Bones. Next will be Ted Couser, and he lives on an acreage near Garland, Nebraska, and recently retired as vice president of Lincoln Benefit Life, which is an insurance company here in Lincoln. He is the editor and publisher of Windflower Press, which is a small press, excuse me, small press specializing in contemporary poetry. 
He is the author of nine collections of poetry, including Sure Signs, One World at a Time, and Weather Central. Next reader will be Marge Sizer, and she lives in Lincoln and really appreciates the support and encouragement her husband gives her in her writing endeavors. Her poems have been collected in All My Grandmothers Could Sing, Adjoining Rooms, and Well Springs, and her first full-length collection entitled Bones of a Very Fine Hand is forthcoming from Backwaters Press. And our final reader is Roy Scheel. He lives in Lincoln, but he's the poet in residence and professor of English at Doan College in Crete. He too is an author of many collections in poetry, including Pointing Out the Sky, The Voice We Call Human, Short, Sweet, and Keeping the Horses. So with that, let's welcome Twyla. Thank you. <coughs> well, we have 10 to 12 minutes, so I'm going to get right to it. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Prairie. There are those who think the prairie unimportant, but this place, where soil and deep-rooted grasses meet, carries on, where hawks loop low into the wind without wing beat, where owls hide in cottonwoods, where dick sizzles in a swaying landscape cling to seed heads, where the sun, to dictate each day, rises due east. Now this remnant, now that, patches here and again across the plains where great animals roamed, bones and blood of ancestors purloined for study, an entire region steeped in history, tribes and traditions and burial sites, hunting grounds and gathering places, a civilized nation filled with story and survival, dismissed as prehistoric, pre-European, pre-settlement, pre-plow, pre-grazing, pre-fences, pre-rifle. A stiff breeze further bends the blanched grass blades, hairy sumac seeds, brown-headed lespedisa, underfoot, matted thatch, beyond, switchgrass, and overhead, big blue stem. The cause of blackbirds tossed into untamed air. I cannot walk easily over this thick muslin. I am hungry to remain, to get away. Thirsty, yet these roots hoard all moisture. Poor, in spite of verdant topsoil. I lie at ground level, carrying on. My face not at odds with, just now, the rising sun. I'd like to read a few poems from um, the um, Plain Sense 2. I recommend it. Everyone should get a copy. This first one's called Scars, and it's a poem where uh, time is compressed. And um, there's a saying um, that I really like when it comes to writing. It's just because it didn't happen doesn't mean it's not true. And this poem is uh, sort of like that. It's in my first book, Scars. It was a summer our well was going dry and my brothers both had jobs in town. One evening, the older one drove home the lumber yard's ancient station wagon, proceeded to clean it up before supper. Something about impressing his boss, only the younger one wasn't impressed, saying, chores come first, get your ass over here and help. The older one kept washing and washing with the end of the garden hose. My younger brother whirled him by his belt loops on the, on the, onto the gravel. Their fists and punches hit like they were playing it this time, for real. Mother came screaming out of the house, flailing about somebody getting hurt, helpless as a hanky in a downpour. The cows stood heavy and bellowing from the barnyard while my brothers clashed, their bodies rolling over and over in the knotweed. This time, Dad not there to help them. We were losing the farm that summer. My brothers suddenly groaned, and everything going down deeper into the ditch, 
even the last of the water. This one's called, If My Father Were Still Alive. If my father were still alive, I would tell him of the cows, watch his face return with a story of my granddaughter, how sometimes in her dreams they loom massive over her with their bulbous eyes, their bluish leaky udders, their crushing leaden hooves. How she, how'd she come up with cows, he'd ask, meaning city child. And of course, I'd be at a loss, mother having targeted pickles as a cause of my nightmares. <laughs> if my father were still alive, I could tell him I'd no longer wake in the night, recalling his grayness, his eyes and mouth wide open as if caught at the end by surprise. But rather as the farmer in his 40s, I, not much older than my granddaughter, he full of muscle and sweat and grin, sleeves of his work shirt rolled up, spreading grain and feed bunks, to those rows of mammoth tongues, those bony rumps, those dumb, curious creatures inclined to wander off into the dark. The next poem I'd like to read is um, it's one of those uh, poems that comes out of reading something weird in the newspaper. And it had happened, it sort of came about is because I was, um, I was with my two granddaughters who are here tonight. And uh, I thought I'd read this story. It's called The Snowball Sisters. I happened to read in the paper, um, uh, do you ever pick up on this, like, the Earth was once a giant snowball. They figure this out. <laughs> the Snowball Sisters. Behind me, behind the sofa, two little sisters stand styling my hair, combs, bands, and barrettes, their tools put to serious use, their voices from somewhere far in the back of their blameless throats. Reading the news, I try to picture it. Earth, once a gigantic snowball. Now there's evidence our planet turned so cold, oceans froze from pole to equator. Half a billion years ago, for some 10 million years, thawing then in a sudden greenhouse effect. Their breaths, uttering tiny dictums, are cool and sweet. Today the sun bears down a scorching sphere, concrete a willing and absorbing heat sink. Have we finally decided more is better? The ozone shrinks. I obey their every command. Volcanoes, however, keep, keep, keep belching carbon. The runaway glaciation cannot last. I read faster. Then all hell breaks loose, the scientist says. The meltdown is rapid. Evolution, we are told, speeded up, defining everything, complex species. In a few short months, it will be winter, the onward march. Glaciers wait patiently on mount mountain slopes, days shorten. We will be cozy around the fire or throwing snowballs. Youth, youth as it was meant to be, perfectly wasted on the young. Worms and snails, meanwhile, burrowing into the ocean floor, stirring up gases. The younger one swipes at my bangs with a brush. I'm frozen in place. The older one pauses, swatching my hair in her hand, whispers, this will only hurt a little. <laughs> Next one is, um, is one I wrote um, <laughs> watching my husband do one of his 10 million house projects. Uh, we have a house we built 27 years ago that'll never be done. <laughs> it's called This Early Evening. 
This early evening, he is on top of plywood, on top of what will be roof of the new addition, crawling around, nailing down tar paper. I cannot watch him lean toward the edge with the round metal discs, hammer, nails. I don't know why. Why it hides my legs stiffen when I must descend. Why I suddenly feel heavy or clumsy or both. Last year at the Anasazi ruins, tall ladders taking us from one ancient level to the next. He laughs at photos. Look, she's got a death grip on that rung. Now's the time for deafness and buoyancy, sweetness and light. The gravity of air, not earth, balancing on the tip of a feather. Think bird and wing, the parting of airwaves. This early evening from a ladder on the edge of the new roof, my knees weak watching him, and overhead gulls circling, circling and turning, disappearing over the treetops, the sun hitting their undersides as if cotton hankies in the sky, floating, soaring. In early fall, a gathering of robust gulls going south, their webbed feet dangling freely in the wind along for the ride. And I'll end with this poem called Saving Room. <clears throat> I don't know what to say about it other than this is the last poem I'll read. <laughs> Saving room. When my young granddaughter at the dinner table announces she's saving room right here, pointing to her side for dessert, we break out the cookies. Room enough for a small treat, room enough for love, that non-fattening, non-dairy topping, the low-cal, low-cholesterol additive, nourishing, place next to the heart where all things are possible. Morning, noon, and midnight in the garden of good and evil, that mini splendor, splendor thing between the devil and the deep blue sea. When I was young, my father asked which half of me belonged to him, which half belonged to my mother. My seriousness caused him to grin. Luckily, I never chose. He's been gone a decade now. Now, after eight decades, my mother is learning how to dance. Foxtrot and waltz and two-step, my arthritic, stoop-shouldered mother gliding in some stranger's arms across a wooden floor. The heart, that unexplored universe, ever expanding. Her face, in telling us, beams radiant. I wonder, will I, too, someday? Take a chance on love, the song says. Love's a four-letter word, and says another. And only fools rush in. Yet, just in case, I'm saving room right here. for coming. <clears throat> um, I just finished a manuscript for, uh, of a book, and um, it's based on, I have, a, I have a practice of going for a two-mile walk every morning at sunrise, and uh, each of these poems was written after the walk. And um, I walk the, pretty much the same road every day, so the, the, the opening poem kind of sets the stage, and then I'm just going to read right through these. Now, the titles of these poems are um, have the date and then a little comment about the weather usually, but, um, and I don't know how we'll do here in 10 minutes, but we'll do our best. Um, as I said, this is the first one. The, the book is called uh, Winter Morning Walks, 100 Postcards to Jim Harrison, because I taped these all on postcards and sent them to this friend of mine. The quarry road rumbles toward me out of the early morning darkness, lustrous with frost, an unrolled bolt of softly glowing fabric interwoven with tiny glass beads on silver thread. The cloth spilled out and then lovingly smoothed by my father's hand as he stands behind his wooden counter, 
<coughs> excuse me, dark as these fields at Tilden's store so many years ago. Here, he says, smiling, you can make something special with this. November 20th, clear and still, a heavy frost. The pale gray road lit only by stars. A rabbit runs ahead, then stops at the edge of the sound of my footsteps, then runs ahead and stops again, trembling in darkness on the cold outer rim of the present. November 22nd, sunny and cool, thin clouds. In his drab gray overcoat, unbuttoned and flying out behind, a stocky, bullet-headed owl with dirty claws and thick wrists slowly flaps home from working the night shift. He is so tired he has forgotten his lunchbox, his pay stub. He will not be able to sleep in his empty apartment, what with the neighboring blackbirds flying into his face, but will stay awake all morning, round-shouldered and glassy-eyed, composing a poem about paradise perfectly woven of mouse bones and moist pieces of fur. <laughs> November 28th, chilly and clear. There was a time when my long gray cashmere top coat was cigarette smoke, and my snappy felt Homburg was alcohol, and the paisley silk scarf at my neck with its fringed end tossed carelessly over my shoulder was laughter rich with irony. Look at me now. December 9th, clear, still, and cold. Fence post to fence post, just out of reach, a bank swallow led me into the sunrise. Black, white, and gray, like a half-burned love letter, floating up out of a fire, she led me along. I would like to have read what was left of that message, read on its feathery edges with dawn. December 18th, gusty and forty at dawn. Sunlight like honey this morning, and a stiff wind spreading it smoothly over the blue stem. Two miles downwind from Hartman's Quarry, I hear the exuberant backing up song of a dump truck, and directly above me, a red-tailed hawk responds with its lispy whistle. Burnt red seed heads of buckbrush, green duckweed over the beaver pond, Todd Holly's red combine parked on a hilltop as if to show the sun the way. The eye contains the world in a space no bigger than a baby's fist. December 31st, cold and snowing. The opening pages forgotten, then the sadness of my mother's death and the cold, wet chapters of spring. For me, featureless text of summer burning with illness, a long convalescence, then a conclusion in which the first hard frosts are lovingly described. A bibliography of falling leaves, an index of bare trees, and finally, a crow flying like a signature over the soft white end papers of the year. January 4th, four below zero. My wife took an apple to work this morning, hurriedly picking it up and out of a plastic bag on the kitchen counter. And though she has been gone an hour, the open bag still holds in a swirl the graceful turn of her wrist, a fountain lifting. And now I can see that the air by the closet door keeps the bell-like hollow she made spinning into her winter coat while pushing her apple through a sleeve and back out into the ordinary. January 19th, still thawing, breezy. Arthritic and weak, my old dog, Hattie, stumbles behind me over the snow. When I stop, she stops, tipped to one side like a folding table with one of the legs not snapped in place. Head bowed, one ear turned down to the earth as if she could hear it turning. She is losing the trail at the end of her 14th year. Now she must follow. Once she could catch a season running and shake it by the neck till the leaves fell off, but now they get away, flashing their tails as they bound off over the hill. Maybe she doesn't see them out of those cloudy, wet brown eyes. Maybe she no longer cares. I thought for a while last summer that I might die before my dogs, but it seems I was wrong. She wobbles a little way ahead of me now, barking her sharp, small bark, 
then stops and trembles, excited, on point, at the spot that leads out of the world. February 26, 38 degrees at sunrise. As if he were turning a key in a lock, the old magician turns his fist and opens it and shakes out a pink silk scarf, then snaps it in the air to our applause. Just so our ancient Christmas cactus, two months late, has suddenly shaken a half dozen blooms from the tips of its fingers. It was a gift from my father 20 years ago, and I had begun to worry that he had given up reminding us. But this morning he's back in his place in front of the mirror of time, where he snaps a pink silk handkerchief and folds it into his jacket pocket. March 2nd, patchy clouds and windy. All morning our house has been flashing in and out of shade like a signal, and far across the waves of grass a neighbor's house has answered, offering help. If I have to abandon this life, they tell me they'll pull me across in a leather harness clipped to the telephone line. And I'll close with this one. My wife is, a, is the managing editor of the Journal Star, and she's crazy about newspapers, and this is a little portrait of her reading the paper. She starts to read while still standing in bathrobes, socks, and glasses, sweeping the newspaper up and snapping it flat the way the wind snaps a bed sheet hung on a line. And her gaze is a steady wind as she settles into her chair, the sharp and earnest wind of March, getting in under the leaves of the words and turning them over and over, then letting them tumble and skip into drifts in her wake, fresh arrangements of news for tomorrow's attention. Thank you. I'd like to start with a poem about a prairie plant, the downy gentian. A story was told to me by someone who visited prairie cemeteries. I went to this lecture and he told about um, being in the cemetery that had been mowed faithfully twice a year for about 50 years, but then it wasn't mowed, and that he was eager to see how the prairie looked that summer in that cemetery. And he found a prairie gentian blooming, knew that it hadn't bloomed for years and years because the prairie gentian blooms in September and it had been mowed off and didn't give up. And I, I couldn't forget that story. So I told it to my daughter at one point when she was needing some strength, as we all do sometimes. I wanted to have a painting by um, Wendy Jane Bantam for the cover of my book, and I gave her the poem and wanted to see what she did with the, the downy gentian. So I thought I would show it to you. This is called Downy Gentian Grasshopper. And it's Wendy Jane Bantam's Downy Gentian. Deep roots those prairie plants have. I tell her of the Downy Gentian. I tell her of the prairie cemetery mowed twice every summer. I tell her how after 50 years the mowers died or moved away. And the prairie, ungroomed, grew noisy with grasshoppers, hands of big blue stem in the air all summer long. The downy gentian, 50 summers cut off at the throat, bloomed that September purple and strong. 
bright cups set down in tall grass prairie. My daughter moves barefoot as if in fields through the rooms of her house. Her body bending over books, silhouetted in windows, thin hands scraping carrots, slicing onions. Can you see her deciding? Can you see her down into darkness like the bones of a very fine hand? The undeniable roots reaching down, staying. Um, I thought of the roots of those prairie plants. They're very fine like hairs and they go down six feet or eight feet like the bones of a very fine hand. One place to um, get well is to be outdoors and to be with the family, which my daughter did. It happened that we, were, we went to the mountains to spend some time together. So this poem is called Getting Well in the Mountains. In the mountains, my daughter wanted to play cards. The four of us played pitch quietly her baby sleeping in the next room. We had to guffaw quietly and say damn quietly and pound the table quietly. She bid cautiously and cared too much. And she thought with her brother as her partner, they would whip us bad. But I played so loose I couldn't lose, bid on nothing and got the ace in the blind. I went set more than anybody and yet we won. I hardly knew the score most of the time. I bid seven or eight. You can always make seven. All you have to do is bid at first before anybody else. The games were hilarious because she is witty and Paul is fun and Don began to take some risks. Remember how Heidi got well in the mountains, ate bread and cheese and ran rosy cheeked through the Alpen asters, slept in the loft of her grandfather's hut at 10,000 feet, played with the goats and the goat herd and got healthy in every way. My daughter got stronger and stronger. She had her own cabin, slept long and walked down in the morning, her boots crunching the gravel. I'd see her coming and tell the baby and turn him loose to run out and greet her. She'd come in for pancakes, sit down and ask how he slept that night. Sometimes she'd go to town, play miniature golf, and go to movies, or hike up to lakes. Don took her to the Stanley for lunch, and Paul built her a fire under the stars and toasted marshmallows for her. After the first night, I thought maybe she wouldn't want more pitch, because it's boring to play with somebody who bids all the time. <laughs> but no, the next night she wanted to know if we'd play cards again. I want her to enjoy the lake and the child and all her life, all her life. I'm trying not to worry because worry is stupid. Action is the thing. I want to listen because when I listen, I learn that what she really wants is to move the crib into my cabin and what she really wants is to carry the baby on her back down the trail. We stood on the bridge and watched the water wash the rocks watch two streams come together, tried to remember which is Wind River and which is Glacier Creek, the peaks we know better, and we name them together, Otis, Hallett's, Thatchtop, Longs, Mount Lady Washington, Storm, Teddy's Teeth. What she wants is to go ahead into the hot sun into the valley or up to Oozle Falls. I stay in the shade with the child, I want to give her time and space and a hug every morning. I want to say, your hair looks so good and that's a good shirt. What I want is the window open, the best air in the world coming in, the lake very blue, the undersides of the trees very green. What I want is to tell her, pretend you have the ace king joker. What I want to say is, bid high name Trump.
another card game in this poem. This is my 80-year-old aunt. Um, they grew up in the country, and now they live in Rapid City, and they still get together to play canasta. I thought it would be nice if I could be along. My old aunts play canasta in a snowstorm. While there is time, I must read the wrinkles around each faded blue eye, related to my father's blue eye, related to me. I must ride along in the back seat. The aunt who can drive will pick up each sister at her door, six in all. We'll keep the Pontiac chugging in each driveway while the one or the other puts her overshoes on and steps out, pulling the door shut with a click. The wind lifting the brown fringe of her white cotton scarf as she comes down the sidewalk, still pulling on her new polyester Christmas stocking mittens, right hand, left hand. We have no business to be out in such a storm, she says, no business at all. But the wind takes her laughing, cracking voice and lifts it. And she sinks into the back seat or the front seat onto the next house, the next sidewalk, the heater blowing to beat the band. It is a good canasta day. The deuce is wild, even as they were in childhood. The wind blowing through the empty apple trees, through the shadows of bumper crops. The cards line up under the long finger bones. Eights and nines and aces straggle and fall into place. Long time habits are well behaved children. My ants shuffle and meld, the discard pile frozen, the wind a red tray to be remarked upon, remembered, and appreciated because, as one or the other says, we are getting up there in the years. We'll have to quit sometime. But today, today, deal, sister, deal. <coughs> Keeping on with my card theme, this is uh, hearts. And if you play hearts, you know that <coughs> you don't want to get any hearts unless you can get all the hearts. And in this poem, um, I have my, my mother playing hearts, but I'm thinking of her killing snakes in the garden. The head of the snake backs away from my mother, backs away above its body, its body in coils against the row of onions, its tail shaking out with a noise. My mother's arms, her hoe raised above her head, down like a judgment. The head of the snake is tailless before her, its jaws opening and closing, its body a whip in the radish leaves, whipping slower, whipping looser. She holds the handle of the hoe, resting the blade on the ground, studies the cards that have been played, playing her own cards close to her vest, conversation flowing by around her. She sees a way. If she can just get rid of three losers, just three, just two, just this one more trick past the unsuspecting Vera who is so intent on getting no hearts. Ah, the jack. That does it. My mother brings down swiftly the ten, king, queen, ace. All you holding cards around this table, what you are dealing with, none of you can know. Not one of you has any idea. And I'll close with a poem called He Rang the Bell. No card game here. My father rang the bell Sundays, sat in the pew, not singing, his hymnal open on his knees, heard a thousand times that he was a wretch and a worm, 
but he didn't tell me to stay in the church he stuck to. At the kitchen table, a strand of hair hanging over his forehead. He said, a person has to do what they have to do. That night he was coughing and trying to talk. I said, maybe he should rest. I wish he would have kept talking. When I stand mornings at the window and look at the pines in my backyard, two Austrians and one blank space where I had the diseased tree cut down, I wish I had let him keep coughing and talking when he wanted to, lying against the pillows, his arms and hands out on the sheet. Another time he asked me, will you get my shoes? I'm going home. Will you help me? I wish I would have looked for his shoes. We could have made it as far as the elevator. I wish I would have found my keys in his shoes. I wish we would have tried. After pushing his IV card in the halls of the hospital, bumping along beside him with the bags, my father wearing his cap because his hair was falling out. After his buddy Curly came to ask him to try to drink the stuff in the little condensed milk cans. After his sisters drove all night to stand in the hall and come into his room by twos to say goodbye. After these things. After standing at the bed with my mother in a ring with my sisters, holding his big block layer's hand, listening to the sounds in his throat as he was trying to break through, hoping the next pause in the noise would mean he was free of it. After holding his hand that last Sunday and watching the crow on the rocks of the roof outside his window, the bird flapping its wings, I holding his hand, thinking sometimes how he had scratched the back of his hands when he had been more conscious. He'd had that habit, scratching one hand with the other, as long as I'd known him. After thinking of him milking a cow in the middle of a pasture, or laying blocks, a carpenter's pencil stuck at a funny angle under the edge of his cap, or driving the old black and white Chevy fast to Jameson to get parts. After the nurse brought a plastic bag into his room, laid in my needlework, a yellow quilt I never finished, the newspapers, the wool slippers I had brought him from Wales, after she handed the bag to me, saying he was a very good man. I knew she would say the same to the daughter of the next one, and yet I was grateful to her for saying it. After these things, I was empty and calm as a field of grass, a window opening on the rocked surface of a roof, a slab of sky in a strange city, a crow flapping. I've chosen several poems to read from Plain Sense of Things this evening, and I'll, I'll try to read a few somewhat newer pieces as well. The first uh, is called Eohippus. Um, many of you, I imagine, have, have seen this in the Biorama down at Morrill Hall, the, the small, sort of camel-looking, uh, dog-sized <coughs> original horse. Um, and I wrote about this some years ago. I, I wrote... Uh, I tried a form I had never tried before. It's called a dizane. Uh, it's a ten-line um, stanzaic form, and I just made, made it a whole poem here. Um, Eohippus literally translated means dawn horse. Eohippus. Horse of the dawn, given free morning rain to browse here in the sea of waving grass, after the inland sea became a plain and rudimentary mammals came to pass, I see you now etched in a lens's glass at the small end of evolution's scope, tethered by placidity, not a rope. 
grazing contentedly among your kind, scenting the wind, breaking into a lope, the future dark and far beyond your mind. <clears throat> I think I'm going to, if you'll excuse me a moment, I'm going to get a drink of water. I've been wanting to do that. the rituals of nervousness. <clears throat> this next poem is a love poem, and uh, I think I'll just read it to you. I won't try to explain it. It's a little bit like explaining a joke. <laughs> you see, what's funny about that is <laughs> it's called Paired Off. What are we, you and I? Lying together in the dark beneath a deeper dark of winter sky. And each star like a hatchboard crack we mark our place beneath the heavens by. Innocent as animals on the ark. The hold is dark and deep. Still smelling faintly of the wood the adze shaped into rafters. And we sleep broken in two again as though we stood watch on ourselves, bodies a heap like a slumber of shavings. It is good. And while we sleep, the ship rides lightly, its boards pop and creak, till consciousness gradually gets a grip on us again. And though we do not speak at first, we are poured to the lip like cups with feeling and our limbs are weak. Uh, this next poem is a sonnet. I, I, over the years, I've written a lot of sonnets. I couldn't even hazard a guess. But I suppose among the so-called forms, it's my favorite form. Um, and I write a lot of nonce sonnets, which is to say they're sonnets where, I, where I'm making up the form. In this particular sonnet, uh, you might or might not notice there's only one rhyme sound, and the rhymes occur four lines apart, which means when I get to the last rhyme, I've got an extra line left over. So <coughs> it, it, it sounds unrhymed a lot of the time. Maybe it kind of splits the difference between rhyme and blank verse. I'm not sure. This one is called River Man. Down to the river's edge at early light, the bird song thinning out like drawing dew. Mist on the water over the current sound, he goes to run his trot lines. The sun is bright now in the east, spilled gold behind the clouds, and bits of it tremble on the water. Behind the trees ahead and out of sight, a single hawk goes sailing. For just one lavish moment, alone now on the river, he feels it's his alone, and from that height of feeling kneels to check a line whose slack reveals an empty hook. Something, at least, he thinks, went nosing by last night, and he spits on the bait for luck and drops it back. <clears throat> I'm going to read a prose poem um, this is about um, our grandson, our younger grandson, whose name is Martin. It's called Martin's Apple. Small and round and green and just within his reach, the early apple catches my grandson's eye. He stands on tiptoe, delighted by it, a smile widening on his lips. His right index finger points upward into the tree, his left hand is ready to close on the apple. Watching, I am glad I did not prune this lowest, most ungainly limb. Something, perhaps a sense of this reaching and straining of his, held me back. There, he almost has it now, and now he does. For a second, perfectly fitted to his hand, it's his, before slipping away in a thrash of foliage but still secure on its swaying stem, still in the orbit of his desire. He turns, laughing a 14 months old, pure, deep laughter, turns back, 
and on tiptoe tries again. And once again, the apple holds still for him. <coughs> this puts me under a lot more duress than I'm used to being under. I'm used to standing up in front of a class and teaching where there are no vaudeville hooks or anything like that. <laughs> Not even sure how long I've been up here. Oh, well. Uh, <clears throat> I'll read a couple of, of uh, somewhat newer poems. Uh, this one's called November Greenhouse. The light is muted like the inside of a tent. And there beneath the dome's wide arch repose the dreaming epiphytes trained on dowels and strings and the land-bound orchids in ceramic pots, Cattleya, Phalaenopsis, petals glistening like dull spun sugar. Somewhere toward the back, a trickle of water pours itself over and over. The aisles between the tables, concrete floored, where the day's unswept debris, fern tips, bits of twine, some few poor fallen blossoms. The water pours and pours. And here's Persephone, the dark and flaking bulbs in shallow bins, waiting to bear their richness underground when someone turns the earth and buries them, tulip, daffodil, narcissus, deep down, each corm pressed into exile in the loam. The bins are fixed on tables and extend around the corner halfway down one wall making a bracket near the entranceway. Thinking ahead to spring, our ritual when days grow short, the dark more threatening. It's only human of us, after all. The Norfolk pines with their fine needled boughs supple against the pull of gravity, the ruddy stacks of terracotta pots, those tables toward the back where water pours, loaded with houseplants in their various greens. There is a poise and balance here we need, and we will have it by hook or crooked green thumb, whether we force a bulb or plant a seed. <clears throat> this one's called the bee tree. This January morning of my birthday, it is bright and cold, and my thoughts turn elsewhere. Back to that summer morning in the mountains when I looked out from the cabin years ago and saw the light flick in a dusty shimmer. Small winged bodies hover round the entrance and disappear within the trunk's dark hollow high up in the bark of an Austrian pine. The edges of the hole, like a slow pinwheel, crawled with the bodies of the quartering bees. And I thought of their long labor in the flowers, ransacking the meadow's sweetness without stop, packing it back to their hold there in the air, and filling each waxen cell clear to the top. <clears throat> um, the last poem I'll read is called Workshop, and this is pretty recent. I believe it was last Friday when I finished this. Workshop. Slant drifts of sawdust on the concrete floor, a shuffling snow. The grain a loiter here in shavings, in pale gold rigid pairings like torn scrolls. The spirit level with its sidelong bubble pocking the amber chamber of its poise. The plane here set aside, the pure trued board, the finger plane beside it of blued steel. Under a hooded bulb, the wood's own savor, its fragrance in the nostrils, and the film of dust that is its archive on the table, the slow accretion of its taking form. Now all is surface, and the finger runs in sheer delight across the evenness, and the least imperfection looms and stuns. Thank you. <clears throat>